All right, what's up guys? Welcome back to another lecture of orbital mechanics. Yes. So if you remember last time what we did is that we went from orbital elements to the components x, y, z of position and velocity vectors seen in the inertial reference frame, ECI. But today what we want to do is do the inverse problem and that is to go from r and v vector up to orbital elements, okay? And this process is referred to as preliminary orbit determination. So orbit determination in the sense that we are determining what is our orbit looking like in terms of size, shape, orientation, and position of spacecraft along the orbit, that is to find the orbital elements. And the reason why we refer to that process as a preliminary orbit determination process is because in practice, while well, we use that to get a first guess of a current orbit from ground-based measurements, um, but that process would get refined with highly advanced statistical methods, common filtering techniques, and so on. So this is just a first guess of an orbit given some ground-based measurements. Those ground-based measurements will be our position vector, velocity vector of the spacecraft, as well as the time at which those two measurements were taken from the ground. Okay, so this is what we have as our inputs and the technique will then calculate our six orbital elements that we know very well by now. Okay, so this is orbit determination. Um, the first, yeah. 2.8.1, I'm going to refer to it as OD for orbit determination and then specifically from position and velocity measurements. Because we're going to see another technique for orbit determination in 2.8.2 later on that uses other inputs or other types of measurements. But this one is kind of the most basic orbit determination technique we can think of. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is to calculate our semi-major axis. A. And for that we're going to use the fact that A can be obtained by minus nu over two times our orbital energy. Turns out that we have a good expression for the orbital energy that says that this is specific kinetic energy, V squared over 2, and then specific potential energy minus nu over R. That's very convenient because we know that we are given velocity vector and position vector to begin with. These are the inputs of the process. And therefore, all we have to do is to calculate the norm of those two vectors that are given to us. Like that. Calculate the norms. Plug this back into the orbital energy equation. Figure this out. Plug it back into here and use a constant. And boom, we have just calculated the first orbital element. Okay? Step one. So you see that the entire procedure is pretty much plug and play. There's no really difficulties associated with it. So in other words, I expect you all to get 100% if that ever comes up in an exam. Okay, second orbital element we're going to solve for is the eccentricity. Given R and V again. And for this, we need to go back to the definition of the eccentricity vector that we had previously in chapter 2, which is velocity vector cross product specific orbital angular momentum vector h all this over mu minus position vector r over distance r we are given again our velocity vector 
and the position vector as the input. So the only unknown really here is the specific orbital angular momentum vector, but we know how to calculate it. I'm going to say h is equal to r cross v. Okay? So plug it back here. And of course, r had been determined when we had looked at the semi-major axis because that was needed to calculate the orbital energy from which we had plugged into the semi-major axis equation. So r is just, again, the norm of the position vector r. Okay? And once you have the eccentricity vector, obviously, all you have to do is to take the norm of this vector, and that's it. Very easy. Two out of six already. Next one up is our inclination. With a T. Inclination angle. So here we have to remember what does the inclination angle refer to. So let's draw an orbit real quick. Say this is the Earth in blue. And we have our orbit like that around the Earth. We know that our ECI reference frame is located with its origin at the center of the Earth. I X pointing at a star, I Y in the equatorial plane, and I Z along the Earth spin axis, like this. But also we know that our orbital angular momentum vector, if the spacecraft would happen to travel in this direction along the orbit, like that, well, then A should be perpendicular to the orbital plane and would be obtained by the cross product of position and velocity. So then that would give us a vector perpendicular to the orbital plane like that, H. And we had said when we had first defined the inclination angle that that was the angle between the orbital plane and the equatorial plane here. But if you look at the drawing, this angle happens to be exactly the same as this one. Okay? So given this, we know that we could then apply the dot product of those two vectors, which are h and iz, and get the angle out of that. Okay? So we're going to say that h vector dot product of iz will be the norm of h vector, which is h, times the norm of iz, which is iz, and cos of the angle between those two vectors, which happen to be our inclination angle. Okay, but then we're smart and remember that iz is a unit vector, meaning that the norm of iz vector is simply 1. And then we can solve that equation for the inclination angle by taking the arc cos, cos minus 1, of h vector dot product iz vector over h, like that. Where I had used the fact that h was simply the norm of this vector. Obviously like that, okay? So this is how we can find the inclination angle based on R and V vectors because we know that we had calculated the H vector previously. IZ, we know it's oriented along the spin axis and thereby its components along X, Y, Z in ECI reference frame are just 0, 0, 1. So that's easy to figure it out. H being the norm of H vector. We have everything we need here to calculate third orbital element given our v vectors and the time of observation or the time of measurement. 
Okay, that's that's it for the inclination. Now I'm going to move on to Rayan or the right ascension of ascending node. So, if you go back to the section where I introduce all the orbital elements, you'll remember that rayon is actually the angle between two vectors, those two vectors being Ix of the ECI reference frame. Okay? And the vector pointing at the line of nodes and specifically towards the ascending node. So this is the orbit, the ascending node would be right here, and this is what we had defined as being capital N vector, and rayon was this angle here, such that, again, we could simply use the dot product definition and say that dot product of Ix with the vector pointing at the ascending node will be equal to the norm of the first vector times the norm of the second one times cos of the angle between the two, which is rayon. So what we can do is then realize that Ix norm is equal to 1 and solve that equation for rayon and say that rayon will be arc cos of the dot product between ix vector and n vector over the norm of n, like that. But we're missing the n vector, so we're going to say that n vector can also be obtained by a cross product. If this is your orbit angular momentum vector h, if you happen to do the cross product between i, z, and h, you're going to get directly the intersection of the orbital plane with the equatorial plane, which happens to be where this vector is pointing along to. Okay? So again, i, z, cross product h would give us n. i, z, we know h was obtained previously, so we have everything we need to calculate n vector, and then n magnitude is just the norm of this vector. Plug this back in here, and then obtain ray n. With ray n, though, there is an extra, extra step involved to make sure that the arcos gives us rayon in the right quadrant. So the check is only to look at the dot product between n and y. And if this is larger or equal than 0, then it means that rayon will be located between 0 and pi radian. And if this dot product of n with Iy is less than zero or negative, that means that our rayon will be between pi and two pi. Okay? Just an extra check that you need to do in the end to make sure you have rayon where it needs to be. Nice. It's going very well. We have already determined semi-major axis, eccentricity, inclination, now rayon. Next one up will be the argument of perigee. Argument of perigee. Omega. So omega is again the angle between two very specific vectors, going back to our discussion on orbital elements. And if you refer to the three-dimensional figure I had drawn on the board, you will realize that omega is actually 
the angle between n, which is the vector pointing at the ascending node, and the eccentricity vector that points in the direction of the perigee. So based on this, we can just use the same trick, and that is to take the dot product of those two vectors, applying the definition. We're going to get n times e times cos of the angle between those two vectors, which happens to be our argument of perigee. So again, we just need to solve that equation for omega, which is going to be arc cos of this dot product over norm of n times the norm of e. Eccentricity vector and eccentricity scalar were obtained in the second step of this orbit determination process. That was the second orbital element for which we had solved for. We had n from before, so we have everything we need already to solve for the argument of perigee omega. But similarly to the rayon, there is a, a quick check that we need to perform. And this time, this is going to look at the dot product between eccentricity vector and iz vector. So if this happens to be a positive number, it means that our omega will be comprised between 0 and pi. And if this dot product between eccentricity and iz unit vector is less than zero, then it means that our argument of perigee will be in the range of pi to two pi. Don't forget about this little check here to make sure that the answer is not in the wrong quadrant because of the arc cos trig function involved. All right, then we're already at the last orbital element we need to solve, given r, v vectors and the time of observation from a ground-based ground station, for example. And the sixth one is our TP, which is is it time of perigee passage or time since perigee passage? Hopefully you've done your homework and remember that this is time of perigee passage. Time since perigee passage is T minus TP. Okay, so time of perigee passage is our sixth orbital element. And here what we're going to need to solve for it is to define another angle. And that other angle is known as argument of latitude and is denoted by U. Argument of latitude. And U is actually the summation of argument of perigee which goes from n vector, direction of the ascending node, all the way to the perigee, plus the true anomaly, which is from the eccentricity vector or the perigee, all the way to the position vector of the spacecraft. So all in all, u corresponds to the angle between the line of node pointing at the ascending node and r vector. All right, such that based on this fact, I'm going to write it down here. So this is angle between the direction of the ascending node and our position vector, such that we're going to use the same trick as before, and that is to take the dot product between n and nr to write that this is n magnitude, r magnitude, cos of argument of latitude, u. And then we're going to solve that equation for what we're looking for. u, which is r cos of this dot product over the norm of n times r, like this. 
then there is a quadrant check step that we need to do here again. For that, we're going to take the dot product between R vector and IZ, unit vector. And if the scalar that we get out of it happens to be positive or equal to zero, then it means that our argument of latitude will be comprised between zero and pi. And if this dot product happens to be negative, then it just means that our argument of latitude will be in the range between pi and 2 pi. But that gives us u. But we needed time of perigee passage. So there are extra steps involved here. And the next step is to go from argument of latitude to true anomaly where our true anomaly would be argument of latitude minus argument of perigee. Argument of perigee was determined in the previous step. We've just solved for argument of latitude. We put it in the right quadrant, and then we get the true anomaly. And then we need to convert the true anomaly to eccentric anomaly. Do you remember how we can do it? Yes, and that is just to use the tan half angle here equals square root of 1 minus e over 1 plus e tan true anomaly over 2. Centricity was found previously. We just got theta. Plug everything in here. Do the arc tan 2 times that and we're going to get our eccentric anomaly e. And then the very last step of this orbit determination process to go from our v vectors and the time of observation to our six orbital elements is to use Kepler's time equation and then just solve it for TP, which will be T minus eccentric anomaly minus E sine eccentric anomaly, all this divided by N which is the mean motion, which can be calculated as square root of mu over a cube. And because we have a from the very first step, our semi-major axis, and we have everything we need on this side to calculate the final orbital element, which is tp. And t was one of the uh, given variables to begin the process. That was r v vectors, and the time at which those two vectors have been obtained in seconds, okay? And again, this is straight from Kepler's time equation. Excellent, excellent. So again, that was OD from position velocity measurements and time of measurement, which is the most fundamental technique in terms of orbit determination which is the process, again, of obtaining the orbital elements. Next up, we're going to look at a much more complex orbit determination technique. And this one, so I'm going to say OD, is going to be based not on position velocity vector measurements, but based on two position vectors only. Okay, so OD from two position vectors. All right, so that would be, for example, if you are on the ground, the ground station equipped with a big radar tracking spacecraft as they orbit around the Earth, like that, and the spacecraft goes in your field of view and then you take one measurement at T1, and it gives you this position vector. And then you take you wait from for some for some time. And then you take another measurement when the spacecraft is somewhere else above the horizon, flying above the ground station. And that one gives you R2 and the time of observation of this one T2.
Okay? So all you have is those two position vectors, but no velocity information, and obviously the time of observation. Okay. So this is the problem. So let's see how we can solve it. And by the way, this problem of using two position vectors to solve for the six orbital elements is widely referred to as Lambert's problem, which used to be one of the most studied uh, astrodynamics fundamental problems back then. And there were many researchers that came up with different solutions to solve for that particular problem, which isn't very trivial. And the easiest solution to this famous problem is actually coming from Gauss, AU, not UA, okay? Sorry, Gauss. Like that. Uh, back in the 18th century, okay? So Gauss's solution is what we're going to have a look at to solve Lambert's problem. Note that Gauss's solution is only valid whenever the true anomaly difference between the two observation time is less than pi over 2. It's only for, I'm going to say, angle difference. Less than pi over 2. If the uh, angle difference between those two position vectors that you happen to be measuring with your ground station through radar measurements is more than pi over 2, the solution I'm about to derive on the board won't work. And also, this only works for elliptical orbits. If you had a spacecraft orbiting along a perfectly circular orbit, Gauss's solution won't be valid anymore. Okay, so there are many solutions that are applicable to specific situations. And again, today we're going to only focus on Gauss's solution. For elliptical orbits, whenever the angle between the two measurements is less than pi over 2. And the trick here is actually to make use of the previous orbit determination technique that we derived that was uh, using R and V <coughs> uh, vector measurements at a given time. So here what we'll try to solve is to go from R1 and R2 through Gauss's solution. to get R1 <clears throat> and V1, and then back into our previous OD solution using R and V at some time of observation. And that one also uses T1 and T2, okay? And then finally our six orbital elements. So Gauss's solution on its own won't give you directly the six orbital elements, but rather will give you R and V as a pair of vectors, either at the first observation time, R1, V1, or at R2, V2. It doesn't matter as long as those two vectors are kind of taken as a pair and correspond to the same measurement instant, T1 or T2. And then we're going to use R and V at some time using the previous solution we derived together. Okay? So how to go from R1, R2 to position velocity at the same measurement instant is all about Gauss's solution. So what we know is that because the motion of the spacecraft takes place along the orbital plane, then we can very well write 
R2 vector as a linear combination of R1 plus V1. In other words, and that's an arc of an orbit, and this is M1, if we have R1 here and R2 over there, the two measurement, uh, the two measurements we are having at our disposal, spacecraft of T equal T1 and that one at some future time at T2 and if the spacecraft at T1 had a velocity vector like this V1 then because those three vectors are all coplanar then we can easily uh, do a linear combination of R1 and V1, add those together to obtain our R2. For example, if you were to scale R1 by a given factor that we're going to call F, so that would be F R1, and you see that I didn't change the direction of R1, I just scaled it with a factor less than 1, which is f, and then add to it the v1 without changing its direction, but just by scaling it through another factor known as g, v1, then I can easily obtain r2. It's only a matter of selecting the proper f and g scaling factors, and I can just use any two vectors in the plane to obtain any other one. So that's the jilt of it here. So I'm going to say that R2 obtained as a linear combination of R1 and V1 through F scaling factor and through the G scaling factor like that. So Gauss's solutions objective comes down to finding F and G such that we are then able to solve that equation for V1, our unknown, given R2 and given R1 over G like that. Okay? Because again, if I can figure out F and G and just plug this back into this very simple equation and given R1 vector, R2 vector, then I'll be able to get V1 vector. And then with R1 and V1 using the previous solution we had for orbit determination given position, velocity vectors, and time of observation, and then calculate the orbital elements out of it. Okay, so that is the fundamental objective here those two scaling factors with which you need to scale R1 and V1 in order to be able to combine them in a linear fashion to obtain R2 are known as the Lagrangian coefficients. Lagrangian coefficients. Okay, so now that we know that this is what we're after, the f and the g Lagrangian coefficients, let's see how we can calculate for those. I'm going to say f and g in terms of true normally difference. Okay, so first up what we're going to do is write R2 vector and V2 vector in terms of what they are in the perifocal reference frame and combine those two in a matrix form. Okay. 
In other words, I'm going to focus on the components of R2 in the perifocal reference frame, neglecting the Z component because from before we know that Px and Py are in the orbital plane where the motion is taking place, but Pz is out of the plane such that the Pz component of any position and velocity vectors of, of a spacecraft will always be equal to zero. So neglecting the third component, I can then write, as before, that R2, or R, is equal to R cos theta along Px. And in this case, because we're looking at R2 specifically, I'm going to use R2 cos true anomaly number 2 along Px. So R2, this times that, plus a component along Py, which is only R2 sine theta 2. Now V2 can also be expressed in terms of its x, y, z, x, and y components in a perifocal reference frame. And the trick from before was just to take the time derivative of our position vector. But doing that and doing some algebraic manipulations, which are included in the lecture notes, I didn't cover that on the board last time due to time constraint. But how to go from the time derivative of this to something we can uh, more easily manage is all included in the lecture notes. And the solution to that is simply minus square root of mu over p sine theta 2 because I'm all I'm again looking at uh, the second measurement here specifically at time number 2 that is for its x component the velocity and for the y component I'm going to need a little bit more room I'm going to write square root of mu p times p plus cos theta 2. Okay? So this form to express the x and y components of a velocity vector in perifocal is a lot more useful than just leaving it as r2 dot cos theta and minus r sine theta and theta dot as we did last time but to go from the derivative of those components to those components for the velocity is all again in the lecture notes. The process to do so is not that important. What we wanted here was only the solution. Okay, so now what all we've done was to express position in terms of x, y components in the perifocal reference frame, neglecting the z component. And we did the same for the velocity vector in perifocal reference frame, x, and y component, and again neglecting the z one, because it was it will always be equal to zero, no matter what. Okay. Um, so this is relating R two to B two has a nonlinear function of. Px and Py. Like this. Next up, what we're going to do is then relate Px and Py unit vectors to not R2V2, but this time to R1, V1, like this. And then combine those two relationships to express R2V2 as a big nonlinear function of R1V1. And then just by inspecting the equation we're going to get, extract out of it the S and G Lagrangian coefficients. All right? So this is the bulk of the work ahead of us now. Now, how can we get Px, Py as a function of R1V1? Well, now, 
we have to look at number one instead of number two. That's the first thing we need to do. And swap out the subscript two to the subscript one everywhere. Okay, but that gives us a relationship R1V1 as a function of PX, PY, but I wanted the inverse relationship. So the trick is simply to take the inverse of this two by two matrix to get what we're looking for, or in other words, PX, PY equal to this two by two matrix inverse and then times R1, V1, like that. Now, we have to remember how to take the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. So for a given matrix A, which is A11, A12, A21, and A22, Generically speaking, we can take or obtain the inverse of this matrix by doing 1 over the determinant of the original matrix A times a 2 by 2 matrix for which we swap out the elements around. And specifically, we swap out the A22 with the A11. And those two remain at the same location, yet they become negative. Okay? So this is the very definition of the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix, and that's exactly what we need to do here, but applied to this uh, highly nonlinear matrix here because it has a bunch of sine and cosine and square roots. Okay? So let's do it. We're going to keep this matrix up there because we're going to need it. So the inverse of this, oh, let's define the determinant. The determinant of the matrix A is this times this minus this times that. A11 times A22 minus A12, A21. So the inverse of this, and to make things easier, let's just say that this is our A matrix here, such that the inverse of this specific matrix will be equal to 1 over this times that. So let's do it. R1 cos 1 times square root of mu over P times E plus cos theta 1 minus and minus minus so it becomes positive R1 sine theta 1 times this guy right there which is square root of mu over P times sine theta Theta 1, obviously, okay? So all this is for the 1 over the determinant. And we then have to multiply all of this with a 2 by 2 matrix constructed out of the original one, yet by swapping things around and swapping the signs of those two here. I'm going to say that this is times square root of mu over P, P plus cos Theta 1, I just took this and moved it there. So I'm going to take this one and move it here. So here we're going to have R1 cos theta 1. That one stays at the same location, yet becomes negative. So minus R1 sine theta 1. And this one again becomes positive because it was negative before. 
let's say square root of mu over p sine theta 1. Okay. Oh, thankfully I have an eight foot long whiteboard because otherwise it would have been difficult to write that big equation in one line. <laughs> so all we have to do now, it's not very diff difficult, but it is a bit tedious because it's such a massive equation, is to simplify it to something that kind of makes more sense. I'm going to say the inverse of this 2 by 2 matrix is going to be, well, the one thing we notice here on the denominator of the 1 over determinant term is that both terms are multiplied with R1 square root of mu over P. Like this, I'm going to factor this out. So 1 over R1 times square root of mu over p. This is going to be, I'm going to multiply the cos theta 1 inside this matrix. And then here all I have is the sine square of theta 1. So this times e cos theta 1. plus cos squared theta 1 plus sine squared theta 1. Good. And the 2 by 2 matrix here I don't think there's something we can do with it just going to say as before so take this and put it inside there we're not going to change it okay so let's keep focusing on the one over determinant term here times the two by two which is still this guy so what we have here is R1 square root mu over P times essentially, this is one, sine square plus cos square is one, so one plus E cos theta one. This is kind of familiar, isn't it? The one plus E cos theta, because this happens to be the denominator of the orbit equation, which says that r is equal to p over 1 plus e cos theta. So that's exactly what we're going to do next, and that is to substitute r1 by using the orbit equation. So 1 over times a 2 by 2 matrix, which is again the same thing. But now, R1 said that that was P over 1 plus E cos theta 1 times square root of mu P times 1 plus E cos theta 1. And what you notice is that indeed this cancels out that one. And then we can go back. One well, this can simply write one over the square root of mu times p and that's it. So square root of mu times p is one is what we now ended up with for one over the determinant. So I'm gonna continue playing with that equation and now I'm in a good place to be able to multiply the one 
over square root of mu p to my two by two matrix to my a minus one one over square root of mu p like that. Essentially, square root of mu over p times 1 over square root of mu p gives us 1 over p simply. So, our a minus 1 matrix, we are now going to get 1 over p times e plus cos theta 1 and minus r1 times this factor, so 1 over square root of mu p sine theta 1, close the bracket, and this is not this minus that, but this is just another element in the 2 by 2 matrix. Now we have the same thing as before, 1 over square root of mu p times square root of mu over p, it just gives us 1 over p like that sine theta 1 and then r1 divided by this times cos theta 1. There we go. So that is the inverse of our 2 by 2 matrix we had. But let's go back to kind of the goal of this section and the overall process because I know that some of you might have gotten lost in the process, okay? So the intent here was to relate px, py by taking the inverse of our 2 by 2, which is now this result, and then times r1, v1. Okay? And the reason why we needed that expression is that from before we had obtained R2 V2 equal to the simpler 2 by 2 matrix times PX PY but then we've established that PX PY can be obtained as function of R1 V1 such that what we're going to do next is express R2 V2 equal to the 2 by 2 matrix that was evaluated at theta 2 times the inverse of that evaluated at theta 1 and R1. Okay, so I'm going to say 2 by 2 inverse but at theta 1 R1. That one was theta 2 R2 times R1 V uh, R1 V1 like that and then we're going to focus only on R2 and express R2 vector as a function of R1 V1 so ultimately if we don't bother with the second uh, row of that 2 by 1 matrix we just write R2 being function of R1 plus function of V1 as well. And just by inspection, we're going to call this RF and that here, RG, which are the two Lagrangian coefficients that we were after in the first place, okay? Whew. So let's do it. Let's express R2, is that in the shop? Yeah, R2, V2 equal to what we had previously for the 2 by 2 matrix, the original one, which was R2 cos theta 2, R2 sine theta 2, minus square root mu over p, sine theta 2, and here square root of mu over p times e plus cos theta 2, 
this was originally multiplied with px, py, but we're going to substitute px, py with all of it. So times one over p, one over p, sine of theta one, and here r one over square root. Mu P cos theta one close this bracket and this one is minus R for root minus P sine theta one and that was E plus cos theta one. Two by two times two by two and then let's not forget about R one v1 at the very end of this very lengthy matrix equation. Okay, what do we do from there? Well, I just told you two minutes ago, all we have to do is then do a linear algebra to express R2 as a nonlinear function of R1, V1, and then look at the coefficients that will be multiplying R1, V1, and just call them F and G based on our original equation for the Lagrangian coefficients. Okay. So, let's do it. We're going to get R2 equal to R2 cos theta 2 over p times e plus cos theta 1. This is this times that. Yep. Plus the R2 sine theta 2 over P times sine theta 1 plus R2 sine theta 2 over P times sine theta 1. So this multiplies R1. And then for the term that multiplies V1, we then have R2, R1, so plus or minus, plus, minus, minus, uh, minus R1, R2, sine theta 1, cos theta 2 over square root mu p let me let me do plus minus this plus the other term r1 r2 over the same factor for mu p times cos theta 1 uh -oh, times sine theta 2 and then I'm going to close the bracket for all of it and multiply this with our v1. Okay? So it's just linear algebra, 2 by 2 times 2 by 2. And then looking only at the first row of the result. And this is what we get. Well, that is very convenient because if you remember, where we started this entire process was to say that R2 could have been obtained as a linear combination of R1 and V1 through F. And through 
G. Remember, and I said the process is all about determining F and G. Turns out we have them just by looking at the above expression because all of this in the curly brackets is my G because this is what multiplies V1. And all of this inside the first set of brackets is my F because this is what multiplies R1. I'm going to come back and say that F is then equal to R2 cos theta 2 over P and E plus cos theta 1 plus R2 sine theta 2 over P sine theta 1 and that my G is simply equal to minus R1 R2 over square root of mu P times sine theta 1 cos theta 2 plus R1 R2 over the same factor, square root of mu p times cos theta 1 and sine theta 2. But wait, wait, we don't have all we need to solve for f and g based on those two expressions. Do we? While well, we have r1 vector r2 vector and the time t1 and t2 but here we have yeah r2 is okay r1 2 the mu is constant but what about theta 1 and what about theta 2 i don't have those well that's problematic isn't it well no not really because we're going to make use of trig identities to be able to solve for the unknowns in the f and g Lagrangian coefficients expressions. Okay. So we're going to use trig identities. of them. The first one says I'm going to use C and S for cos and sine respectively to go a bit faster. So cos theta 2 cos theta 1 plus sine theta 2 sine theta 1. This can be replaced by cos of theta 2 minus theta 1 and the second trig identity is the one that says sine theta 2 cos theta 1 minus cos theta 2 sine theta 1 equal to sine theta 2 minus theta 1. How is that going to help me? Well, because We can, for example, here factor out r1, r2 over square root of mu p and end up with sine theta 1 cos theta 2 plus cos theta 1 sine theta 2. And then just use one of those two trig identities accordingly and use it. Okay? So using those two trig identities and f and g would allow us to write them as 1 minus R2 uh, not that fast not that fast let me let me do it out wrong, okay we're not in a rush so I'm going to factor out 
Well, first off, I'm going to multiply everything here in this parenthesis and write R2 cos theta 2 over P times eccentricity plus R2 cos theta 2 cos theta 1 over P this plus R2 over P sine theta 2 sine theta 1 that's for this expression for F which can be further rewritten as I still have the E yeah so this one, there's not much we can do with it yet. So I'm going to leave it as R2 cos theta 2e over p. Plus, looking at those two, I'm going to factor out R2 over p. And then write that this multiplies cos theta 2, cos theta 1, plus sine theta 2, sine theta 1. Do we have an expression for that? cos cos plus sine sine yes that works out so I'm going to come back here and then write that my f can be simplified a bit by saying that this is r2 cos theta 2 times eccentricity over p plus r2 over p of cos theta 2 minus theta 1. Okay, that's it for F. Now we'll do the same process, but this time for G, and see what we get. All right, so for G, I don't have the eccentricity anywhere, so all I can do is factor out R1, R2 over square root of mu p and multiplies cos theta 1 minus oops, cos theta 1 times sine theta 2, theta 2, sine theta 2 like that minus cos theta 2 sine theta 1 which means that G can now be rewritten making use of this trig identity the second one and is going to be equal to R1 R2 over square root of mu p times cos theta 1 sine theta 2 minus cos theta 2 sine theta 1 yes that works times sine of theta 2 minus theta 1 are we done yet no we're not done yet <laughs> fortunately because it's fun or unfortunately because you're getting tired I don't know uh, I like to do those derivations, so fortunately for me, it's not done yet. Okay, so what can we do here? Well, the first thing is that we could make use of the orbit equation for simplifying this term here. Because our orbit equation applied to point number 2 would give us that R2 is equal to P over 1 plus e cos theta 2 such that I could solve my e cos theta 2 term by multiplying with r2 e cos theta 2 well actually 1 plus e cos theta 2 e equal p over r2 or alternatively e cos theta 2 
equal to P over R2 minus 1 and plug it back in here, okay? So this becomes equal to R2 P times P R2 minus 1 plus R2 P cos of theta 2 minus theta 1. Okay. So I'm just going to keep playing with F, so I'm going to go left to right or right to left here. So I want to erase my G to be subsequent discussion we're going to have. So this could get simplified to this times that. I mean, they cancel out, so that gives us 1 minus R2 to the P. All of this plus R2 to the P cos theta 2 minus theta 1. which can further be simplified as 1 minus R2 over P and multiplies 1 minus cos of theta 2 minus theta 1. Does that make sense? 1 minus R2 over P times 1, yes. Yeah, that's good. So let me move it up here to the left. 1 minus R2 P. 1 minus cos theta 2 minus theta 1. And close the curly bracket. And hopefully most of you are still with me. Still there? Thank you. Good. Boy, I've simplified things quite a bit, didn't I? So, again, what is given to us? We know R1 vector, we know R2 vector, we know T2, and we know T1. So I can easily take the norm of R1 and R2 and plug those two quantities back into those equations. That fixes up the R1, R2 terms, that's good. The ones, I don't care about those. But look at what we have here. Theta 2 minus theta 1. Oh, no. That wasn't given to us. What can we do? Well, wait. We have those two vectors. From M1 to the first observation when the spacecraft was around here. This is R1 vector. And whenever the spacecraft was at another location uh, above the ground station down the road, so that is R2. Eccentricity pointing in the direction of your perigee as per usual, like that. Okay? So you want me to take true anomaly number two minus true anomaly number one. Or in other words, all we need here is the angle between R2 and R1. This is what theta 2 minus theta 1 represents. Can we do it? Can we determine the angle between two vectors? The answer is yes. And the way to do it is through the dot product. Because you know that dot product of R1 and R2 would be R1 norm times R2 norm, cos of the angle between those two vectors, which happens to be theta 2 minus theta 1. So all we have to do is solve that equation. Take theta 2 minus theta 1 being equal to R cos of R1 
dot product R2 over R1 R2. Boom. All this are given to me. R1, R2 vectors, R1, R2 magnitude, we know, such that now we can easily calculate theta 2 minus theta 1 and plug it back there and there. Yes, we're done. Or, wait, no. Are we missing something else? Yes. We are still missing the P terms in those two expressions. Oh boy, it is a lengthy process, okay? But we're thankfully almost at the end of it. So first, just to summarize where we are now, we had first been able to express R2 as a linear combination of R1 and V1 through the Lagrangian coefficients f and g. Based on that linear expression, we then solve that for v1. And v1 was shown to be a function of r1, r2, f, and g. Good. We now have expressions for f and g that, that we can almost calculate based on what is given to us. But we still have one unknown, and that is p. Okay? So the next a step in the entire orbit determination process or Gauss's solution to Lambert's problem is to figure out how to calculate P given what we have. And what we have again is R1 vector, R2 vector. We know we can get theta 2 minus theta 1 easily and we have the time of observations T2 and T1. So to solve for P Gauss has used what's known as the sector triangle area ratio. I used to, not ratio, <laughs> ratio. I used to do the full demonstration of this technique, but I think what is important here is how to apply it in a practical way. So instead, I'm just going to give you the answer, so i.e. how to find P, which is the last remaining unknown in the entire process. Turns out that P is obtained by eta squared R1 vector cross product R2 vector, and only looking at the norm of that, squaring it over mu, gravitational constant, times T2 minus T1, which we know, right? This is the time difference between both observations. Square. Oh no, oh no, again, we have R1, R2, we know T2, T1, we know mu. What about N? Is it ever going to end? Yes because n, eta, is obtained through an iterative process. Yes, we like iterations, don't we? But this one is a monster of an iteration as a heads up. So buckle up. Okay? This is, it is going to get intense. So, eta. The next iteration of eta, known as eta i plus 1, is going to be equal to the previous or the current iteration minus something which is function of the current one, eta i, times the ratio of eta i minus the previous one the i minus 1. All of this divided by a function of the current one minus of the same function but evaluated at the previous eta. Whew. Okay? This multiplies that. It's like this. 
well, first off, what is that function I'm talking about here? into which I'm going to plug either eta i or eta i minus 1. I'm going to say where f of any function or function of any variables, we're going to use x, but just keep in mind that when you get to eta i, you're going to substitute x for eta i or use x for eta i minus 1 accordingly, okay? That function is going to be 1 minus x plus m over x squared times w. Okay? Now the question is, what is m? What is w? M in red. Let's put W in blue. So W is actually equal to 2G minus sine of 2G over sine cube of G. And G here is not the gravitational acceleration, unfortunately. That would be just too easy. So where G is actually 2 arc sine of square root of M over eta square minus L. Oh no, we're still going down the drain here. So what is M? Well, we needed M here. I'm just going to say that M, which you need here and over here. M is mu times the difference in time between both observations, T2 minus T1 square. That we can easily understand. Times 2 times square root of R1 norm times R2 norm that we have. Cos theta 2 minus theta 1 over 2 that we know how to get thankfully and the whole denominator here is actually cube okay all right that is kind of understandable makes sense but we also have L to figure out in the process in order to get G in order to get W in order to use in the iterative procedure here to get eta i plus 1. Okay? So for L, it is going to be R1 plus R2 over 4 square root of R1, R2 cos theta 2 minus theta 1 over 2 and all this minus 1 half. So from the get-go we can easily calculate L, we can calculate M and then we can use the expressions for F and G evaluated either at eta i or eta i minus 1 depending on uh, which term we're trying to calculate in the iterative process here. But in order to calculate eta 2, we need to know the value of eta 1 and eta naught. Correct? So how are we going to initialize the iterative procedure given the fact that we need kind of two previous values? Well, I'm about to give you the answer to that question. The answer is that eta 1 is going to be equal to eta h plus 0.1, and that eta 2 is going to be equal to eta h. Now, what is eta h? Get ready, ladies and gentlemen, because this one is not obvious at all. 
it is 12 over 22 plus 10 over 22 square root of 1 plus 44 m over 9 times l plus 5 6 like that obviously isn't that obvious no it's not okay so all this to say that gauss was a very smart cookie okay so you start the iterative process with eta 1 and eta 2 eta 1 is the i minus 1 eta 2 is the i based on those two values that you calculate empirically based on the l and the m that you calculated from the get-go from what is given to you you are now able to calculate eta 3 through the iterative procedure okay and by using the function that we talked about and defined earlier and once you have eta 3 you're going to use eta 2 eta 3 to calculate eta 4 and so on and so on and again you keep iterating for as long as you want or it can do it okay and in exam I'll never ask you more than two iterations of this entire procedure because this is a time-consuming task to perform by hand but again if you do have access to MATLAB Simulink feel free to iterate up to a hundred iterations it won't take you much time to do it okay it's just a matter of coding things properly in the for loop from i equal 1 to 100 and then you let MATLAB iterate on that. So let's summarize Gauss's solution to Lambert's problem here because this is quite complex or lengthy process. So you are given r1 vector, r2 vector and the time at which those two observations were made. The first thing you want to do is calculate P. Okay, and I gave you the solution for P. Turns out that P was function of eta. So the very first thing you have to do in Gauss's solution is to solve that iterative procedure for eta. Once you have eta, you plug it back into the sector triangle area ratio that I gave you. Remember that was the equation for P. And then once you have P, you've solved the key for everything because that was the most challenging uh, task associated with Gauss's solution because with P you can substitute into the expressions for F and G which are the Lagrangian coefficients now with F and G you go back to the very first three equations we had on the board for the sub sub section and solve for V1 okay now that you have V1 vector you just pair it or combine it with the R1 vector and then use the orbit determination process from R and V at a given time that we saw previously, right? That was the first orbit determination technique we talked about today. So again, Gauss's solution, let me just kind of summarize it in block scheme diagram. Gauss's procedure will give you R1, V1 based on R1, and R2. Once you have it, then you use the OD from R and V to get finally the six orbital elements, and then that's it. So doing the entire thing by hand is quite a lengthy procedure, yet it is expected that you could do it by hand. All right? So hope this orbit determination uh, section kind of made sense to you. Hope you've been able to follow throughout the lengthy analytical derivations. And I highly encourage you to try to code something like that in MATLAB Simulink to be able to familiarize yourself with the technique and then compare the MATLAB solution with a handwritten solution such that you can then confirm that you would be ready to go for any exam in order to be able to solve uh, Gauss's solution and the OD problem from RNV by hand. All right. Take care, guys. Thanks for uh, watching the videos. I'll see you next time. See ya.